In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Of course, it's a great occasion. Yesterday, you might have noticed some of you who were here, or a lot of you were here, the, uh, the Jubilee, the 50 years. It's always a great time to look back, but also to look forward. And maybe it is a good reading to be read today about the parable of the sower. Those of us who are aware, we spoke about this maybe before, but uh, just as a reminder. So the third Coptic month is Hatur. And in the old Egyptian calendar, this was the season of sowing. It was the season of planting. It was the time where after the waters of the floods have receded, and the year has started all over again, it is time to prepare for the new harvest. If we want to have a harvest at the end of the year, we have to start sowing from now. So both from a literal perspective and from a spiritual perspective as well. But before I go into that, I just uh, wanted to do a quick trivia just to see how many people are awake. So, how many St. George's did we commemorate today? Three. Five? Where, where did you get five one, from? One, one, <laughs> like, one, one, uh, one, okay, uh, now you're just guessing. So, I'm going to try and remember. How many St. George's did we commemorate today? One. Two. It was two. All right, okay. I'll tell you where. Okay, so there's two that we commemorated today. All right. The first, chronologically, is St. George, who today in the Synexarian was referred to as St. George the Cappadocian. He's the famous St. George that everybody knows. All right? So St. George, George the Cappadocian is the first St. George to be martyred. And history tells us that he was probably a general in the army of someone called the Dadian or Dadianus. That was even before Diocletian, probably sometime in the second cent the third century, the mid-third century, somewhere in the 200s. All right? And that was not the one who we commemorate his martyrdom today. His martyrdom in the Coptic calendar, we remember it on May 1st. All right? So that's going to be later. Today, we commemorate the consecration of his church, Lid, which is, some, Lid, which is somewhere in, I think now, Palestine, I believe, or. Palestine. Right? It's in Palestine, isn't it? Uh, so that's where his first church was consecrated. And this is where the second St. George comes into the story. If you were listening to the Sarexarium properly today, you would have noticed that the father of today's St. George, we call him St. George the Alexandrian, he was a pagan, and probably sometime in the, thir in the, in the beginning of the 4th century, the governor Armanius of, of Alexandria was during the time of Diocletian, and this was during the great persecution in the beginning of the 4th century, and this merchant... He was, in Alex he was from Alexandria, and he was traveling through the Levant, and he saw the, the consecration of the church of St. George, the original St. George, and he believed and became a Christian, and when his first son was born, he named him George after his patron saint, St. George the Cappadocia. And, by the way, Cappadocia is right now where Turkey is, so somewhere in Turkey, just so that you have an idea of the map. Anyway, so... And then today, his martyrdom is what we commemorate. There's a third St. George. We know him as St. George the Mazahim. The Mazahim was his original name. He grew up as a Muslim, and his mother was Christian, and eventually he became Christian, and he became martyred because he converted to the Christian faith. So those are, those are the three... Those are the three main St. Georges that we commemorate in the Coptic Church, the three martyrs, St. George. There, there are other St. Georges who aren't necessarily martyrs, but those are the three main ones that we remember. So just a little bit of trivia to keep in mind whenever you hear St. George, there's going to be a lot of St. Georges. Anyway, back to the original story. 
Let's try to understand. If we want our children, and if we want ourselves to be like those martyrs whom we just talked about, the issue isn't that they died. The issue is that they did not love their life unto death. What does that mean? We hear that in Revelation, where these people saw that God was the most important thing, and Christ is the most important thing. That is why they became martyrs. The martyrdom is the result. It is not something special that happened. The martyrdom that they endured was an end result. It is their harvest. But then we have to go back and look and see how do they become like that in the first place. A lot of us are worried about our own kids and how we can raise them in the love of Christ. A lot of us are looking to ourselves and trying to see how can we grow closer to God? How can we have this great love that those martyrs had, those great monks had, those great saints in general had? We have to first understand, we look at the parable of the sower. And Christ said to his disciples, if you do not understand this parable, you won't understand the rest of them. This was yesterday's reading in, the, uh, in Vespers. He says, if, if you don't understand this, how will you understand the rest of the parables? So this parable is key to understanding what it means to live a spiritual life, the parable of the sower. Number one, we have to notice that God is very gracious. Why? Because if you notice, out of the four kinds of ground that receive seed, only one really is the good ground. So why the waste? Like you even think about it, the, the, the man is walking, the, the sower, and some of the seeds even fall on the wayside, which is the place that people walk on. Of course, in our modern way of thinking, we say that's a waste. Why would he let? Why would he throw stuff, or why did he let allow stuff to fall on places where it's not even meant to plant? But from a spiritual perspective, we can think that God is very gracious. All of us receive baptism, the Holy Spirit. All of us are Christians. And we receive this initial seed inside of us, even though God has not yet seen that we are going to make great use of it. So God is gracious, and he's given it to all of us. All of us here in this church who are baptized, are chrismated, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you see it today, for example, in the reading of Acts, when these people who were not even Jews believed in God, and then God just pours out the Holy Spirit upon them because he's so gracious. He's so loving and so kind and generous that he wants to give it to everybody. So that's one thing. We have to recognize we have a gift. We have a great gift that is sowed inside of us, which is the word of God, the word of God who is a person. We receive a seed, which is God himself. When we take communion from the altar, that is a seed that is put inside of us when we do anything spiritual, these are spiritual works to do what? To till the ground, to make our ground good, to make the soil able to accept a seed and bring forth fruit. A lot of us are thinking, how do we become holy? Or how do we make sure our kids stay on the straight and narrow and be people who love God? We have to sow it in them, and we have to sow it in ourselves. St. James today, in his epistle that we just read, he said what? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? If we are planting the seeds of olives, an olive seed, in the ground, we should not be surprised when we get olives. If we plant in our kids the importance of having a good career and the importance of working hard and the importance of doing all you can to have a good, comfortable life, 
we should not be surprised when we don't find spiritual fruits if we did not put in anything except worldly seed. If all we do for our own selves is exercise and eat well and sleep well and work hard to have a better life and pay our mortgages and pay our bills, we should not be surprised when at harvest time we look and see that where's my spiritual depth? However, if we sow spiritual things, we will reap spiritual things. St. Paul today in his letter to the Corinthians, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Whatever the heart really wants, wants that the hand will do. Whatever the heart really wants, that the hand will do. We have to remember that very well. If we really, really want God, if we really, really want to have a spiritual life and enjoy our life with God, then we will sow those seeds in our own lives and the lives of those around us and in the lives of our children. We want good olive trees. We want a good fig tree. We want whatever, then we sow that seed. We want our kids to be spiritual. We have to at home sow spiritual seeds. Every single one of us who has children and baptize them in the church will remember that the commandment that was given to the parents after the baptism includes these words. Sow in them virtue. Sow in them the love of praise. Sow in them the love of God. It is our job to sow these things in our children. And if we do not plan for that to be happening, we should not be surprised if we see different results later on. And we should do the same thing for ourselves. If we want to see our own... So just to conclude, let us sow good seeds in our own lives. And it is a long process. It is. It's the process of our entire life. That's why the Lord Christ said at the very end of the reading we said today, we will bear fruit with what? With patience. We don't get a crop the next day after we sow the seeds. Anyone who has a yard in front of their house or in the back of their house understands this very well. You put fertilizer, you water it, you aerate it, you take out the weeds. You're doing that all year so that after the snow melts and the spring comes and then maybe into the summer, you look and see a nice green lawn. If we want a nice green lawn and you haven't put fertilizer, if you haven't overseeded, if you haven't taken, gotten, gotten rid of the weeds, if you didn't put enough water in it, then your yard probably doesn't look very good. It is a consistent, almost, I don't want to say daily, but it is a consistent year-round effort. And these are the things we have to learn in our own spiritual lives. So we can be like St. George the Cappadocian, St. George of Alexandria, like all the martyrs, like all the saints. And Christ said it, and he says this a hundred times, and we hear it a lot in Revelation. He who has ears, let him hear. Glory be to God forever. Amen.